we should get started in this time for me. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Rocker, who is our guest for today. He's going to give uh, a lecture. Um, there are a few guests in the room that I want to acknowledge. First, I want to acknowledge Thomas and Gabe. Uh, who are sent uh, songs and they're here to provide valuable tech help. <laughs> <laughs> we are trying to uh, stream this talk on Zoom because there are some people, like for instance, our Alina Alina, who wanted to listen in. And so that's the last thing that they were trying to do. So, because of Sam's public profile, Sam is actually a quite a famous public intellectual who also has to attract attention from various <laughs> people. <laughs> and uh, so apparently, uh, we have heard me in Zoom mom. Yes, twice. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I believe about That's three times something. actually. You haven't even given yet your talk in text <laughs> about critical race theory. No, no, yeah. I don't know how to do it. Well, so, oh, yeah, you're in for a treat. But um, we also have other guests in the room. So I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Jerry Miller, who is an emeritus. So he was a, a, he's a philosophy professor who retired from us some years ago. Very excited to have him here. Thank you, Jerry, for coming. And then we have Dr. Tuske and Dr. Clement, who are colleagues in the philosophy department. Are there any other guests who are in the room for the talk? Would you like to introduce yourself? No? Okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you everybody for the students in the philosophy of education class. Um, it's really going to talk about a text that we've you know worked on for two weeks. Uh, so I want to uh, the answer. Uh, so you hear his interpretation on that. You are welcome to take notes if you want. You are welcome and encouraged to ask questions. And uh, let's get started. Thank you. Thank you. Let anyone see me? I'm actually, if I sit, do I disappear from anyone? A little bit of the view over there. Is that okay? I'll try to sit, but um, and I can already see my second line there a little bit. I'll sit. Um, uh, thank you so much, Christina. Um, we've been dear friends since we were graduate students, and uh, and, and yeah, it's just wonderful to be here. Uh, we drove all the way from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada here, so from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Um, and after this, we're headed down south to Texas, where uh, originally from, uh, before we head back in December. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some, I guess we could call them historical figures, but I want to clarify that I'm not a historian, and I don't presume to be doing uh, history today. Um, I am, though, a philosopher who believes that uh, working that we always are working within history. And so it's that sort of sense of history that I'm going to be um, provoking a bit today. Uh, but I do know that at some points, whenever we get into some of the contexts for Sofa Inés or Marco Gomez de las Casas um, or some other figures, uh, the context can feel historical. But I just want everyone to at least hear me protest at the beginning that this is not history. Um, in terms of the philosophical uh, purpose, I'd like to think today a bit about this idea of what does it mean to speak truth to power? So how many of us have heard that expression, speaking truth to power before, to speak truth to power? It's, it's an expression that comes up, it's a bit of a cliche, I admit. Um, <laughs> uh, it, we tend to use it when the person who is speaking uh, not only is speaking at a different, uh, sort of hierarchical difference to the person they're speaking to, but it usually also means that we kind of like what they're saying. <laughs> uh, I think that in many cases you could say, oh, we're at the trolls who are trying to Zoom bomb you, speaking truth to power, right? Since you're the, the featured speaker and they're just these anonymous uh, hackers going into a Zoom room. Well, uh, I don't know that we could say perhaps they're speaking truth to power, but I think that would... Uh, that would be at the very least controversial for a number of reasons. But 
I want to focus not only on what does it mean to speak truth to power, and I don't only want to look at the historical example of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, in particular, though, her text, La Respuesta, or the, the response or the answer, because of its mode of address, because of the way in which she, I claim, speaks truth to power, namely by writing a letter. And so the, the, the medium of expression or of speech in this case uh, is interesting to me. Uh, the letter. How many of us have perhaps written a letter before? Emails okay. count? I, I think emails count. They're electronic mail, right? So we probably all of us have written letters of various forms and various kinds. I, I'm not a big believer in making hard distinctions between forms of correspondence. I think in general, the it's it's about all revolves at least around the same thing um and so by focusing on the question what does it mean to speak truth to power through the medium of the letter we can also start to kind of excavate a bit into what we're maybe not thinking about or at least what i'm not trying to uh explore today um i like to think of uh some of the examples that we might all be familiar with perhaps or that might be local to this place and environment uh, as a way to kind of get started both what am i saying and both what am i not saying I, we drove over here and we were really pleasantly surprised by the historical lessons on just roadside parks and signs about harriet tubman i'm sure this is not news to anyone who lives here um and uh there was a photo that i took um of one of the signs in the harriet tubman park that really struck me and that I wanted to start off by getting a sense of what it means to speak truth to power, but also to be frank, probably what I'm not going to be focusing on here today, but it was nonetheless inspiring. So it's not to say that it's not interesting or, or important in any way. Um, oh, right, I got a message. So this is a letter from Thomas Wentworth Higginson written in 1859 about Harriet Tubman. It says, quote, her tales of adventure are beyond anything in fiction and her ingenuity and generalship are extraordinary. I have known her for some time, M dash. The slaves call her Moses. And that, that idea of Harriet Tubman as Moses uh, really struck me, really moved me. And it um, reminded me that you know, one of the kind of archetypal characterizations of what it means to speak truth to power is in some sense the let my people go, right? That kind of closes, walks up to Pharaoh and, and declares, you might say, speaking truth to power. Now, when we dig into the, the details of that, and who was Moses in relation to Pharaoh and how did that go and so on and so forth, we, we find that there's maybe a number of complications. But that general mode of address, I think, is also complicated by the fact that Moses was told to speak truth to power. And his biggest impediment at the time from the, the Hebrew exchange within Moses and, and the burning bush was, I can't speak. I'm, I'm tongue-tied. Some people interpret this Hebrew passage as him actually saying, uh, I have a, a speech impediment. I'm not able in the realm of speech. And some say this is the reason why the election of Aaron was important, because that would be someone who could help him with that. But we can see that we're in the sort of zone of speaking truth to power, the mode of address of speech, but we're not, we're not so much in the realm of letters. Ironically, of course, this is taken from a letter about Harriet Tubman relating uh, Tubman to the figure of Moses, uh, who is given over in a form that's been preserved by the letter, namely uh, scripture, and we could take that from the Hebrew scripture all the way to Paul's epistles and letters, and there we see letters kind of popping up as a form more. But none of that really gets quite as close to La Respuesta uh, as another letter that I think we are hopefully familiar with, and that comes to us from the same zone of abolitionist struggle uh, that Tubman uh, was, was fighting for and within, and was certainly inspired by Tubman, but happens a bit later. How many people here have read? Letter from a Birmingham jail, sometimes titled Letter from a Birmingham City Jail. I believe this letter is uh, 
no disrespect to Sofana. This may be the most important letter I believe every person, and particularly every person living in this country, ought to read. I think it's just a super important six page, just over six page, I uh, know just under six page uh, uh, type letter. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this letter, uh, at, and he was jailed. And he was actually, the circumstances of, of being jailed or imprisoned uh, were not only unjust, but they were pretty harsh with them. He was able, though, to be snuck in uh, some documents, including a letter that was written against King without naming him, uh, that was called A Call to Unity, that was signed by about nine clergymen of the uh, Birmingham, Alabama area. And uh, they were essentially, without naming Martin Luther King, uh, referring to him as an outsider uh, and saying that the outsiders who had come to Birmingham were uh, not welcome there and needed to stop uh, stirring up trouble. So um, King uh, is said to have begun writing his response, his respuesta, to that letter in the margins of that uh, uh, forbidden, uh, snuck in to jail letter that he read, and eventually he penned uh, a lengthy reply uh, to these clergymen. Uh, this is where we get quotes like the uh, uh, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, this is where he quotes uh, Aquinas, who himself in that case is quoting Augustine. Uh, he uses, his translation is an unjust law, is no law at all. Lex Iusta, known as Lex. Uh, there's this, this letter is just peppered with important moments. But what I believe is really important about this letter, and that really matters, and that really does get us close to Sofuana in a way that perhaps the figure of Moses through Tubman doesn't quite um, reach, is its, its mode of address, that, it, that, it's, that it's a letter that it's addressed to a certain number of people. And, um, and the reason I think this is important is not just the historical reasons I want to get into with Sofuana and also with Padre Rodriguez Casas. It's the fact that um, maybe one of the things that uh, we might say makes for an educated person is that an educated person not only can speak truth to power, that sounds very idealistic, you know, it's, it's a bit too motivational for my case, but an educated person is someone who can take up the mode of address of the letter and can compose a letter in which in that letter, they may in some significant way be capable of speaking truth to power. In other words, maybe the whole point of a liberal arts education or becoming an educated person is precisely to be the type of person who could write such a letter as we've seen over historical time and as we, I know you've read from Sorpana uh, and as we see Martin Luther King doing. You might say King was writing because he too was a clergyman. He too was a Baptist. He was a Baptist preacher. He, yes, all those things. But when you read his letter, you read the subtlety of his language, and you read his metaphors, and you read his sort of varied allusions and citations. It's also, I think, including it's it's a very political and consequential document, but it's also an eminently educated uh, letter. It's a letter by an educated person speaking to supposedly educated persons who he is essentially saying have been miseducated by their blindness to injustice. And so that is the reason why I believe that when we ask the question, what does it mean to speak truth to power? And we ask it specifically through the interval of the letter as its mode of address versus the more generic, let my people go <laughs> kind of things. Um, that we arrive in a way that's important for you and me here today, because we too, you and I, I believe, can write these kinds of letters and compose these kinds of letters and are doing the work in an educational institution uh, as teachers, as students, as colleagues, uh, to hopefully become the kinds of educated persons that are not only educated in the sense of letters, but also educated and attuned to the, uh, to the sense of injustice that can't be tolerated amidst otherwise educated persons as we saw that exchange. So this kind of starts to map a bit of how I'm trying to look at this. I want to dive down into the 16th and 17th centuries, which is going to sort of contract time against Moses and 
Harriet Tubman, <laughs> Martin Luther King, and Augustine and Aquinas. So we're going to kind of come in. Before I take that leap in the time, I wonder if I could clear the air a bit, see if there's any questions, uh, any, any, any provocations or things you, you're hearing in that early session that aren't clear, perhaps difficult, or, or your own associations maybe with any of that. Has anyone here ever written such a kind of letter before? I mean, yes? Can you say about it, something about it? Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, I actually, in middle school, for an extra credit project, I wrote, I mean, obviously, the has never respond, but I wrote to the press about it. Okay. Um, yeah, that was great. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, what did you say about it? Uh, I. I think this is actually after I went to World Youth Day in Poland. Okay. The Pope spoke. Yeah. And he was speaking about the injustice is the injustice is being done around the world. Yeah. And I think I took that and said it is wrong. And I mean I was like, I was not that intelligent as that. So I'm not. So I, sure. I think it was more like what like it's probably something like why like, can't we be nice to people? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good letter. And that context, by the way. Uh, I think is going to be really important for looking at the at, at so one as letters uh, in a bit. That's really fantastic. Any other any other letters written before? Yeah, Christina. Oh, I'm uh, just thinking that there has been a letter to the president of the university that out loud last Friday or two Fridays ago. Was anyone there? I already asked about it, right? The NWACP chapter at the university wrote a letter to the president okay. about uh, some choices that the university is making that NWACP is announcing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was a very good example. Was anyone there when the letter was read? Why did it happen? And the sure. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. I mean, this gets at something that maybe is, is, I think, important to say before we look at this particular letter is one of the things that's fascinating to me about the letter beyond its maybe biblical characterizations and its historical relevance with the, the ongoing struggle of civil rights and things like that is just that I, I tend to think that whatever it is that we mean when we say the person, so the human person, in particular, that that person is is something that is sort of always a kind of public image. I don't. I think we often think of the personal as like the part that's outside of the public and the private or the individual, and then we see the public as sort of the part that's out in the open, maybe more social with other persons, plural and stuff. But if we just use like one and many as a, as a simple distinction. Persons alone by themselves are in private. Uh, persons together in, in, in the group, uh, that's public. Well, when I'm alone uh, by myself, supposedly in private, I don't know if this is your experience, but I'm never quite alone. Augustine has this saying where he says, my, my inner self was a house divided against itself. I find that when I'm alone, uh, I discover that inside of me are various kinds of persons or various voices that often don't agree and often get confused and often enter into conflict with each other and, and even over time i think of who i was at one time which is different i think or I hope perhaps than i am at another time so on and so forth and so even from that simple one in many argument i don't find anything very compelling there to say that the person as such is is uh, even as the singular person is, is a private and non-public thing. And the letter is clearly personal, right? It's something that you sign off by name, right? It's something that has signatories. It's something that addresses a person or a body, but in this personal mode of address, dear so-and-so, uh, uh, most illustrious <laughs> so-and-so, or you know, however formal it may be, it's personal and the letter has shown itself not only historically, but I think the very concept or idea of the letter is kind of always already public. It's a thing that 
has the function of the open letter, which is literally read in public and written for public view. Um, but but even I would say in its sort of personal function, um, correspondence or letters have this potential for a kind of publicness or for, for being understood in this public sense uh, that goes beyond the merely relational one-to-one -one correspondence. And so that's maybe another conceptual uh, addition to some of this setup. And it gets us right to the situation we find ourselves in um, in the 17th century in Mexico, where, so Juan Inez de la Cruz, I'm assuming a lot of you are familiar with so Juana. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so Juana is a, uh, a mestiza. So on one side, she is Spanish, uh, past, uh, and on the other side, uh, she's an Indian uh, of indigenous origin. And uh, on both sides of some consequence in class, for sure. And, uh, and she is uh, an indisputably uh, educated person. And I guess you could say any, any eligible sense of that, of that term. Um, her interests and her passions uh, are so many. I mean, I could talk about her compositions uh, on, 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 on the theme of St. Catherine of Alexandria. Uh, we could talk about her uh, interests in scholasticism and in particular, you know, developments on the research. We could talk about a lot of things. But one thing that seemed to really bug her was a homily given by a Jesuit priest that was on the early church fathers, on John Chrysostom and on Augustine and on the scholastic Aquinas, on the question of the nature of Christ, the Christology. And this um, homily bothered Sofuana uh, for years, <laughs> so many years that after a period of time, she had a, she had many friendships and also some frenemy ships and also some enemy ships uh, in, in the church. She had sponsors and also uh, uh, enemies and people who you couldn't quite tell which ones they were. Her confessor was an enemy to whom she confessed. So what, what is the confessor who's your enemy? Um, uh, the Virena of Mexico, the vice queen, was uh, by all accounts uh, her dear friend, sponsor, and protector. But there was a bishop, the Bishop of Puebla, who seemed to be her friend, to whom she wrote a letter where she allowed herself to be very uh, forward and very detailed in outlining her exact critiques of this homily given 40 years earlier by this Jesuit uh, priest in a common low mass on, um, on the question of the nature of Christ or Christology uh, using um, very you know, ancient uh, Catholic sources. And this letter is uh, was a letter that did not have a title. It didn't, she didn't write it to this bishop with any kind of uh, fanfare so much, but the bishop uh, published this letter and appended to it a note. And the note was not signed off by the Bishop of Puebla. The Bishop was signed off by another uh, nun or Sor, Sor Filotea. Sor Filotea was the pseudonym used by Francis de Sales whenever he would give his um, uh, uh, sermons uh, and instructions to the convents of his time. So the Bishop of Puebla was not only hiding himself under the pseudonym Sor Filotea, he was also alluding to and, and also affiliating himself to uh, this um, Saint uh, Francis uh, de Sales of, of an earlier time. And so Sor Juana Ines witnesses this letter of hers that was sent in private, <laughs> scare quotes, given what I said about the private public, uh, to the Bishop of Puebla and reads, of course, the, the bishop under the pseudonym Sor Filotea, uh, uh, the response, and she takes three months to write her response, to write her answer. Um, and um, 
I think this is all super important for understanding the nature of this letter and the nature of the need for this letter. The bishop in that letter refers to so Juan Inés's original letter, Carta Antenagorica, as a letter worthy of Athena. And there are entire disputes in the, in the field of Sofuana studies on whether the character of Athena in this case is an attempt to bring Sofuana down into sort of pagan uh, 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 neoclassical sort of outside of Christianity uh, senses, or if it was uh, meant to be elevating in a sort of sarcastic way. One thing, and I think Christina and I may not agree about whether Sofuana was surprised by the fact that the letter was published or not. But one thing I think all scholars agree on is that um, she absolutely knew who Sofiotea was. There's just no doubt, I think, if you read the letter, that she has any question in her mind that she's responding to the Bishop of Puebla, not to this character, Sofiotea. Um, she has a lovely, lovely, uh, she gives this away early in the letter, uh, where she says, and I'll read the, the English translation here um, by Electa Renal and Amanda Powell. And I think her translation is really just a, a really lovely and faithful one. She says, I can answer nothing more to the first obstacle than I am entirely unworthy of your gaze. To the second, I can offer nothing more than amazement instead of thanks, declaring that I am unable to thank you for the slightest part of what I owe you. It is not false humility, my lady, but the candid truth of my very soul to say that when the printed letter reached my hands, the printed letter that is her printed letter with the bishop's tagged on critical commentary, that letter you were pleased to dub worthy of, a, of Athena, I, so Juan Inés, burst into tears. And if I can just make one quick point on, on word wording here. The word in Spanish is a word that is untranslatable. It's prorumpi. To prorumpir is not to simply burst into tears. It's almost to faint, exclaim, and fall into passionate anxiety that comes with tears. It's a, it's a, it's, it goes well beyond a, a moment of uh, a tear dropped out of my eye or something like that. It's to sort of explode with, with passion, not in a erotic, exciting sense of passion, but much more in a sense of frustration and, and of something on the verge of sorrow. Prorumpi, I burst into tears. And then she adds, a thing that does not come easily to me. And many here in English, I think, think she's saying, I don't cry easily. No. She's not saying I don't cry. She's saying I don't just go ballistic that easily. I don't have these moments of total uh, uh, passion that easily. Uh, she isn't just saying I'm a hard crier, right? That's that's. She's saying something different. I don't for a little beat very much. For me, it seemed uh, oh, oh, oh I, tears of confusion, and so she adds a little bit of description onto that pro beat. Um, lágrimas de confusión. That means tears of confusion. That's exactly. For me, it seemed that your great favor was nothing other than God's reproof aimed at my failure to return His favors. And while He corrects others with punishments, He was to chide me through benefits. So this is Sor Juana, in my opinion, on my reading, telling. Sor Filotea, a.k.a. the Bishop of Puebla, I know exactly what happened. I know exactly who you are. <laughs> and I'm not going to think, because this upset me greatly. It's confused me. I thought you were my friend. And I don't know what to make of this. And that's the like, third paragraph of the letter. From there, she launches into a point-by-point -point refutation of the points he raised a recalling of the argument she made in the original letter, and then an excursus on the denial of education to women within the Catholic Church because they had to be educated by men 
And the substitution of the suggestion, uh, I, you read the letter, so I'm probably stunned to see that you are writing up. But the substitution of that pedagogical relationship with women pedagogues. Um, and it's, it's a brilliant excursus, which then comes back around, you know, towards the end to, to respond here. But what to me matters in this exchange, which is not exactly the granular or molecular details of, of the rest of the letter, which I'm sure you've read in more, more deeply than, 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 uh, than I'll get to speak of here today, but is the original question, what does it mean to speak truth to power? Um, well, if we look at how does Sopwane Ness speak truth to power, we have to realize that power really addresses you directly. Um, it's it's very rare that power will speak to you in that direct address. So when Martin Luther King was basically called out, it was at best a subtweet, right? It was you know outsiders, scare quotes. In the very beginning of the of the letter from a Birmingham jail, actually, Martin Luther King says, "Let me tell you what I was doing in Birmingham." <laughs> Because he wants to say, I know you are addressing me as an outsider, but I'm not an outsider. I'm a member of a council that makes its meeting in Atlanta and Birmingham. And we had a meeting in Birmingham. And at that meeting, in other words, he gives them a detailed and technical overview of him saying, I know exactly what you were saying when you didn't use my name. You substituted it in this passive aggressive way with outsiders. And I'm going to respond to you on those terms. In the same way, I believe. So one Ines shows that in order to speak truth to power, you often have to decode power, <laughs> or you have to decode the address of power uh, that you're responding to. And I think this is actually something that demands a lot of sophistication, because in many cases, when power speaks on this differential of oppression or what have you, it's counting on you not being able to decode the address. It's counting on you not being able to dig through the muck and the passive aggressiveness and all of these things to even know that it's talking about you. And if you say, hey, are you talking about me? What do we think the answer would be? Why would you think that? I didn't use your name. I didn't even know you were in town this weekend, Dr. King. I thought you were still in Washington, DC. I, I had no idea. Um, and so if one of had come out and said though, I know you're the Bishop of Puebla. <laughs> I know what you're doing here. Now that would have gone maybe a bit too far or, or, or would it, I don't know. Um, the point though is that there's wit involved here. And I think that wit and what does it mean to speak truth to power is not only in the address, the direct address, but the capacity to interpret and the hermeneutics of being able to interpret the words that aren't saying on their surface what it is that they mean. Um, Sometimes I fear that we get a bit too worked up about reading between the lines. I tell my students at least, like read the lines 10 times and then start reading between the lines because the lines have a lot in them. At the same time, that advice is, is maybe not as useful whenever the lines are there to force you to not see between the lines and to miss what's between the lines. But in other words, in order to be a subtle responder, I think you have to be a subtle leader. And you have to be able to recognize when you're being aggressive, whatever it is, perhaps you know, you're not. And so that's one, one thing to, to take perhaps um, from this. But the other thing is that you'll notice that the um, to speak truth to power often takes the form of a response. It's often not the case that you simply speak through the power ex nihilo from, <laughs> from zero. Um, in some sense, power has to almost manifest itself in order to be spoken to. And this is something I think that's actually really quite important. Um, there is a way of mimicking speaking truth to power by people who I believe think that they're doing it but that they don't know who they're talking to, or they don't know who they're responding to exactly, or they're not aware of who they're in dialogue with, or who they're, who they're in communion with. And I think that's uh, an element of these responses that's important to keep in mind. 
and also, and also to realize that you know uh, your context about your letter, um, you had gone to an event where you heard someone else speak, which made you think about something else here. And so then you wrote to the president, kind of as a response to what you saw and heard in Poland, right? And, and I think that's really important that speaking truth to power is not some kind of individual act of will that comes from nowhere from some sort of deep-seated moral truthful intuition that you simply just explode with. No, it's oftentimes that you're engaging in community and relation with these letters that power perhaps addresses you in or addresses you with um, uh, in, 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 in many cases. And, and I think we can maybe be careful too about not becoming too reactionary about speaking truth to power. That is to say, simply uh, shouting around and not knowing who we're talking to. <laughs> I think that's also a dangerous uh, impulse in some cases uh, within these things. Um, I talk a, a good bit to activists, and um, in my department, we have a lot of people who identify as scholar activists. And I um, I have a lot of questions about what that means, um, and I have sometimes some worries about how that plays itself out. But one thing I always um, Think is really important is to be able to get into the details. In Canada, one of the most pressing situations, as you probably have seen on the news, has been the aftermath of the 2015 findings of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission in Canada, particularly on the treatment of Indigenous and First Nations peoples across Canada. It's a major situation, it's a major issue. And um, while that truth, TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, has been ongoing for some time, it has uh, it has hit some really uh, difficult places lately with the just discovery uh, of burial sites of children in residential schools that were actually a part of that uh, 2015 document, but weren't paid enough attention to, and now threaten the very integrity of that process going back to 2015, 2008, Harper Policy, so on and so forth. We're not in Canada, so I won't you know go on and on about this. But we do live in the Americas. And living in the Americas, I think, requires us to come into contact with this ongoing correspondence that's been happening either through treaties or through any number of kinds of negotiations uh, uh, between settlers and, 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 and colonial states. And so Juan Inez de la Cruz is not only speaking on behalf of and as a, a woman, obviously. Uh, to a powerful clergyman uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, but she's also speaking as a mestiza and as a Basque, as an indigena, as someone who would not ordinarily, in other words, her speech is, I'm gonna use a, 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 a fancier word that's coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw, but it, it's a word that does a lot of work in this area. She's She's giving an intersectional response in the sense that she's not only speaking truth to power from the truth of her status as a lettered woman, as an educated person in that sense, but also as a particular kind of post-colonial subject uh, that wasn't possible before colonization. I always say that uh, Mexicans, I'm Mexican-American, um, we weren't really invented yet uh, in biblical times. <laughs> And stuff like that, you know, there wasn't a, a, such a thing as one could be as this blend of, uh, of, 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 of uh, peninsular Iberian and uh, American pre-Columbian, you know, identity. And uh, so the question of what does it mean to be a person who, who only comes into existence through something that is, by all accounts, uh, in many cases, uh, Difficult politically, morally, all these other things. I mean, these are hard questions. And these are questions that Sofana, I believe, needs to have. Uh, we need to keep in mind that she's bearing those questions alongside, obviously, the feminist reading and all the other readings that we can have of the text. I say that, though, because there's another character who I think is worth saying a few things about as a way to think about the question of what does it mean to speak through power? And then to explore maybe how we might do that. Uh, in our own lives or in our own institution, or perhaps not do that, at least why this is all a horrible idea and a bad example. Okay, that's all great. Um, I mean, I won't agree they're great, but it's great to have a discussion of whether we're to do it or not. 
um, is a character Bartolome de las Casas. Has anyone here heard of Las Casas before? Bartolome de las Casas, great. I see a few people, okay, great. So um, he kind of, well, he doesn't kind of, he's a, he comes a century before Sor Juana. Uh, his father was on Christopher Columbus's second voyage. So whenever we're th th thinking about 1492 <clears throat> as a kind of Genesis date for in colonization, um, Las Casas is very early in that story. He's actually a teenager. Um, and uh, Sevilla, I believe that's Seville in English. Um, whenever one of the first ships comes back with his father on it, and on that ship were boarded um, indigenous peoples from the Americas who were brought in as almost spectacles uh, to be shown uh, to, the, uh, to the elites of, of, of Spanish society as look what we found here. Right? And Las Casas had that early experience as a teenager. As a late teenager, I think at 18 years old, he was brought with his father. Uh, he's a part of the encomienda system, which means he is entitled, scare quotes around that, to uh, own both land and also enslaved indigenous peoples within the uh, Caribbean, uh, the, the Indies, and, uh, and the Yucatan Peninsula, and what we now refer to in general as Latin America. He hears, not unlike the, uh, what I just heard earlier about uh, Poland, he hears some homilies, and these homilies were unlike Sor Juana's homily that really got to her. This homily got to him in a different way, where there was a, a Dominican who said that if anyone refuses to uh, let their people go <laughs> to free enslaved peoples, um, they will pay the price with their soul. They'll be damned. Uh, this group of Dominicans would deny deathbed confessions to members of the Encomienda system if they refused as a um, condition of their penance to free the enslaved peoples on their lands. This got in, this spoke and stirred uh, Las Casas' his soul up to the point that he himself became one of those Dominicans. And uh, in part, I think because of the family he came out of, you heard the story of his father, um, he uh, assumed the role of the Bishop of Chiapas. Chiapas is not that far from Puebla, um, down in the southern part of Mexico and the Indiana Peninsula. And he became known across Spain as the defender of the indígena. Now, um, he also, uh, as much as he participated in the, in the encomienda system and was a part of a royal colonial family, he also saw that the Portuguese in particular were uh, beginning the beginnings of the barbaric middle passage and transatlantic slave trade, primarily to Brazil at the time, to Brazil. And um, early on, he, had to, he saw no issue with that, actually. And he actually wrote to the effect that uh, he was so focused on the enslavement of indigenous peoples that he failed to recognize the moral atrocity of the enslavement of African Americans or Africans at that time. And um, he later in his life saw that as well and, uh, and turned against that, but his abolitionism came slowly across his life. He wrote another, a letter of his own, which is funny to me. Because it uses the Spanish word brevissima, which means like super, super short. And I guess this looks like a short book, but it doesn't read short at all. It reads long. <laughs> um, but he gave a, a brevissima relación de la destrucción de las indias, a very short relation or tale of the destruction of the Indies. And in this report to Prince Philip, he, uh, so he writes directly to the king of Spain. He gives graphic detailed uh, first person observations of the massacre of uh, indigenous peoples across uh, the Caribbean, um, uh, particularly in places we would now call Cuba or Puerto Rico, um, uh, what we've been calling the Pacific Española, Dominican Republic, all these, these spaces and places of, of early colonial uh, Spanish conquest. And um, this report kicked off an entire series of debates uh, called the Valladolid debates between himself and Juan Sepulveda, which is very famous, and where he employs a lot of the same tools that we see Sor Juana in her technical analysis, the part I'm skipping in the letter, the difficult part, right? Uh, he uses scholasticism, especially Thomism. He uses Aristotle. He uses church fathers. He uses Hellenic 
uh, tropes and, and, and Roman uh, ideas. He puts it all to the work of establishing arguments for the, um, the moral aberration of forced conversion, the fact that evangelization must always and everywhere be non-coercive uh, and, and a series of these, of these arguments. Are they the same as Okwana's arguments for the um, vindication of the rights of women, put it in the way Wollstonecraft would put it later on? Uh, no, they're not identical, but I think there's a lot of shared uh, sources. And I think that one cool thing about that is, I don't know if you've heard, but some people sometimes say, well, in that time, people didn't know those things were wrong. You know, people were, were they thought this was fine, so we can't judge them back then. Because we can only judge them now, but it's present and so to speak. Well, these uh, two examples show us, no, but that's not true. During that time, people absolutely knew that these things were wrong and they spoke out against it. And actually there are some great scholars who note that Las Casas is just the famous guy making these arguments. We don't generally, I actually did know the name, I forgot it, of the original Dominican who gave that homily. And so Juana was the famous person who had the ear of the vice queen. So of course everyone knows her, but there were other, there were other lettered women who were also making these arguments, some of them who didn't get fancy responses. And so this is my, my final and third point about what does it mean to speak truth to power? I think for those who have the privilege of speaking truth to power, we cannot pretend that we are the only ones. In other words, the ability to speak truth to power is at some level to accept the fate of Moses, which is Moses is the great liberator who never gets to go to the promised land. Uh, in other words, he's a, it's, it's a tragic thing to have to respond to that. Um, at some level, you lose the relation, that, the relation to what the true abolitionist is. Because of course, the first abolitionist within the context, let's say, of, of, of the abolition uh, an ongoing abolition of slavery, of the carceral state, of the, the shadow state, all these things. The first abolitionist was the very first person whose soul said no whenever a hand was put on their body. That's the first abolitionist, obviously, right? It's not the first person who pens a letter about it. So at some level, to speak truth to power is to realize that the educated person isn't the only person. And that the educated person has a kind of moral duty to not only speak the power, but also to realize that their access to power, the interval within which they have proximity to power, you got to go to Poland, I got to drive <laughs> across the, the United States on sabbatical, we all get to be here in this lovely room in this wonderful campus, what have you. There are perhaps better and other people who might speak truth to power from a place of a more authentic, wouldn't it be great if Las Casas wasn't from a famous family rubbing elbows with Columbus and any other thing? Sure, but I don't think we get that story in history. We find that the, the liberators, Harriet Tubman even I would say, as impressive as, as they may be, and as important as we need to at some level, maybe romanticize them a bit, we also have to realize that the truth that speaks to power in the form of the letter is only one drop in an ocean of people who speak truth to power through their daily lives and struggle and resistance, even of their small, you know, inarticulate voices telling them there's something wrong about this. And so I think speaking truth to power is admirable, but it's uh, a small and tragic and perhaps even um, less less a thing to be celebrated and almost a thing to be mourned, that if you have to find yourself in the situation of speaking truth to power, you're, 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 you're someone who could perhaps be otherwise. I know you all read the coming of John here. And I know you read the, the passage where his sister says, John, does, does, does learning a great many things always make you sad? He said, yes, it does. And the, the question after that is like, you know, would you do it all over again? And he says, yes, I think I would. And then she says, I think I feel sad too. She wants to be, you know, and of course we have the final words by the voice and the wind just in his ears. So to be an activist, to speak truth to power, to be a public intellectual, to be 
So if one anus of goose who lives out her life and dies ultimately in a plague, giving help to her sisters who are dying in that plague, getting herself and dying in, in her 40s, after giving away all of her articles of science and study and whatnot, signing the blood that she would no longer do that. I think the speak truth of power is important, but it's maybe important for different reasons and in different ways and with a different moral weight. And for those of us who find ourselves sitting in a room like this <laughs> um, uh, with uh, positions and jobs like the ones we have here, colleagues, um, with the kind of access and interval and ability to do the things that perhaps we can do, I think we should tread uh, carefully and perhaps with a certain amount of reverence over that ground. And for those reasons, all the more reason, take a stab at doing it and tell people that anyone and everyone can do it. But I hope you can sense that tension there between those two things. So the answer to the question, what does it mean to speak truth to power? I think it means something important, but it's and necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, the sufficiency of that question is going to come ultimately, I think, from other sources and other places, and um, perhaps from even uh, higher powers and other other things that we might consider. But those are my thoughts about the question: What does it mean to speak truth to power in relation to a few of these letters? Among them, so Juan Inés, Bartolomé de las Casas, throwing in their Martin Luther King, just because I'm. Thank you so much for listening. Where are we on time, Lisa? We are great on time. Yeah. yeah. We got a good 20 minutes. Wonderful. Yeah. It's a lot, right? I, I jumped all over the place there, y'all. So I, I feel sorry for people. <laughs> So if you want me to go back to a spot or, or go deeper in a place or maybe uh, finish a point I didn't seem to quite complete, let me know. Can you say that last thing again about it's necessary but not sufficient to be put power for? Yeah, yeah, that perhaps the, the answer to the question of what does it mean to speak to power is that it means that it's important in the sense that, that it has value and significance, but its importance is is necessary, um, how can you say otherwise, but it's not going to be sufficient within the, the, the struggle for justice. Um, and, and that ultimately the voices that speak may speak in other ways than those who have that interval or access to power, proximity to power. Um, one of my concerns here, just to be more concrete and less quick, is that um, I really worry about, I really, really worry about forgetting when we talk about, you know, I'll give you just a quick example. So Juan Inés is a very easy counterfactual to the claim that no one knew in the 17th century that um, that misogyny was bad. Because so Juan Inés knew, and we have her letters. No. But that's not enough, because then that pretends to say, only so Juan Inés knew, and nobody else knew, which almost strengthens the argument in reverse through it's sort of like, it's the it's the, the exception to the rule, but the rule that remains in fact. Scholars have shown, oh, so Juana is the famous one who knew the, the vice queen. There were many, many others. And so that kind of seems to destroy the claim that people didn't know that misogyny was wrong, which of course the moral question or the moral assertion of no one knew is maybe misogyny isn't wrong. Maybe misogyny is just wrong in certain kinds. And in other words, the question I think is a, is a moral, ethical you know, question of universals in particulars. My concern is that even if we say, here's a counterfactual to the claim that misogyny, people didn't know misogyny was wrong in the 17th century, or to the extended claim, Sofona and many, many, many other women and men knew this was wrong and wrote about it as well, is actually, I think, if misogyny is wrong, then every single person who has the moral capacity to feel the evil of misogyny knows it's wrong and that counts as a better and more complete answer to the question to, to the uh, against the claim that people in the 16th century didn't really know this is wrong so it's, and so you can see how it works also in the case of colonialism you know we don't need las casas to show us that people who were having i mean i don't want to be too graphic here and i don't know how much you've read of this but if you read this book it is uh 
there's children in the room, but they're my children, so I'll take a parental exception. There were villages that were committing mass suicide and resistance to the oncoming oppression of the Spaniards because they heard what happened in the villages ahead of them. As, as, a, as a form of, I mean, as, as a form of opposition, but also a form of defeat, I mean, can you imagine that, right? And so, so I, I find it very hard to say that that testimony is somehow not lettered enough to count <laughs> as the claim that people knew this was wrong, right? So people, I think, have been doing, you know, the stories of the Middle Passage and of, and of the way that the ships were loaded and, this, and the resistances aboard of those ships and the slave revolts, of course, that we know of, the Haitian Revolution that we know of, but so many other things, they tell us that, no, it's not simply the fact that, that some people, one person knew this was wrong or some people knew this wrong, but that actually the people who didn't know it was wrong, they're the ones who, who are the anomaly, the moral anomaly of history. They're the ones who should be held accountable for something here. The ones who were who, who have been oppressed, they've known this was wrong since their since their free souls told them this was wrong, that I'm free, I'm not, you know, I'm a free person, I'm a free man, I'm a free woman. And so I think this sort of inverts the very analysis of oppression within history that we think of. And so when we talk in that question of what does it mean to speak truth to power, I think. There's something necessary about the letter as a form of speaking to the power. And it's and it has a form of necessity within the story of liberation that's told and retold time and time. But I don't think it's a sufficient act uh, 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 to either answer those who would claim otherwise about the, the things I said, nor is it a complete act in the sense of King, which says that a, just, uh, a threat to justice anywhere is a, is a threat to justice everywhere, right? where the work isn't over when those letters go out, even if they're affected, even if they have some changes. And by the way, there are there is evidence that also Juana and Las Casas had enormous uh, pragmatic even effects to some degrees and in many ways within Latin America and the world at large. I mean, we're talking about 2021, right? But I don't want to over-determine that significance historically or I would say morally to the something. So that, that's what I was trying to say. So. I mean, there are, there are lots of, of examples where people who spoke to power actually take the ultimate price. Yes. And, 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 and I don't know, I mean, that would be, I think, like, examples where it's necessary and sufficient. Kind of thing. I want to say even, even insufficient, though, in the sense that, of course, they did everything they could do, but that they did that, they would require others to sort of join. In other words, they couldn't do it alone. So right. right. Yeah. Um, it's so funny you mentioned that because the dispute about uh, Christology that Sofana was having was actually ultimately about the humanity of Christ and the ability for Christological redemption through self-sacrifice on the cross to pay a ransom for sin. And in a very different interval, there was a similar conversation going on. Basically, is Christ's death enough to pay the ransom for sin? And you can almost see prefigured in her argument, her later points about misogyny, that insofar as women are still oppressed by the church in the name of Christ, clearly there's something that was missing either on the cross or in the church today. Take your side. That was kind of the sense of her argument. So there's something very um, poetic in your, in your push there, actually, with relation to some point. But now we're getting into theology, and that will really take us somewhere else. Yeah. Right, so we have a question from Dr. Miller. Yes. Uh, he has asked me to see if the students want to ask something. Yeah. And if I know what it is to be a student, if you need a moment to collect your thoughts, we should have a moment. So we can pause and like have 30 seconds of silence, maybe collect your thoughts, and see if you have a question for the speaker. We have we have one of the people who came in, Elena Gostomsky. She's raising her hand for a question. Yes. Let me just turn up the speaker so we can hear. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Okay. Hi. Can you can hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Hi. I I wanted to thank you so much for this talk. I really enjoyed it, and I recently uh, was able to read um, the response to Sor Philatia. Um, so I really enjoyed connecting everything you said to. Um, the reading. Uh, so in your talk, um, I, I understood that you said speaking truth to power, um, it's an engaged activity, you have to do it in community. Mm -hmm. And I know in the response uh, uh, to Sor Philotia, um, Sor Juana speaks of literally living in a community with her sisters at the convent. So I was just curious, um, were her sisters the ones that she was in community with? Or do you think there were there were other groups she was in community with? Um, or just what are your thoughts about that? Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Did everyone hear that question in the room? It's a lovely question. It's a question I frankly have never thought about. So the best questions are the ones that I don't know how to respond to. Um, uh, my intuition is to say, of course, because it's true that she was in a convent. So how could we possibly without a great deal of explanation, say otherwise. Um, and in addition to that, one of the other examples, so I'm just accepting your reading here, actually, this whole clock, and I have nothing I can think of immediately to say against it, or reasons I would, I would caution one side or another. But I would add to that that one of the things that makes this letter so rich, which, again, your point is even enriching in my own imagination as I think about the point I want to make, is that she is speaking across times and places and characters. She's affiliating herself, just as the bishop was affiliating himself to Francis de Sales. She's kind of got this Catherine of Alexandria and Teresa of Avila sort of modes of affiliation. She's also inhabiting the Spanish language in a way that I think is really exciting because the poetas italianizantes of Spain of, of, the, of the 16th century, these were the Italianized poets who read Dante and who read, uh, uh, well, what did Dante do? Why is the Divine Comedy comic? Because it's vernacular, it's vulgar, it's in the common tongue, it's in, it's in Italian. And so the Spanish poetas italianizantes said, we're gonna write like that, we're gonna write in Spanish. And what is born of that? Cervantes, Don Quixote, um, and many others as, as well, but I would say above all the crown jewel of that in literature is the Quixote, which is this epistolary, digressing, absurdist, wild, irreverent, uh, slapstick, uh, two-part series of stories. And all this to say, Solvana is also in community with that literary tradition in a very powerful way. And so the respuesta can be read as this punch to the gut of power, but it's also this jest of power, this laughing at power, this insult and mockery of power, which I think in her poetry, we see a lot more vividly, but it's also at work here. So yes, I think what, what's, what amazes me about your question though, is that many of those skills and studies happen in community with her sisters. So I wonder how many passing jokes in the hallway. <laughs> like she must have been someone who would have been fun to eat with and, and who maybe some maybe she stole some jokes or what have you. But anyway, I love I love the point you made. And I would just extend it to say she's in a, a series of communities, right? And, and I think that's a really important thing. That's why we read, I think. Because um, we want to be in, 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 in we don't want to be lonely. And after that, yeah. there was, when we read the request, that it was really nice to see this catalog of famous women of the past. Yes. That's what one mentioned. I think that's also part of our community. That's why it's so important to you know know of women in the past who did what the brave and learned things that she does. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's another of our collective. Yes. So one of needed to be seen, she even would refer to herself. Uh, satirically as a monster. She hated to be elevated as this radical exception for her time because of her brilliance and her beauty and all these. She really hated that. And she always kind of wanted to insist 
that I am the same woman that every woman has always been throughout time in history. And you might see more of me if you would let us, right? You know, there was a, uh, and this gets to that earlier point of my, my kind of uh, preoccupation with going a bit deeper maybe into the way representation is discussed on that. But yeah, that's great. And now, Dr. Nina, I was really struck by your distinguishing uh, speaking shoots of power in contrast with showering. Yeah. And uh, as I was thinking about that, I thought about the fact when you, uh, I was really struck by your reading of her, her. I don't know what the Spanish word is. Her bursting into tears. Her yeah. Uh, uh, which is a very different reaction from the one I would have had, which would have been complete rage. Rage, sure. And it seems to me that difference is very relevant to Martin Luther King. Mm. Uh, mm. And somehow her whole way of responding it doesn't seem to be a way of uh, getting rid of her tears. It almost seems to be a way of uh, spending her tears. Somewhere. Sure. In the same way I think of King, you know, being beaten and being posed, but not responding, you know, responding obviously with pain and anguish. But somehow it gets transmuted into speech, sure. Instead of shouting, sure. And I, I don't just. I'm yeah, yeah. Fascinated if you could talk yeah. a little bit about. I mean, that. letter, letter, letter from a Birmingham jail is. He's pleading with these clergy who he said, "I expected you of all people to be on our side. I'm so disappointed in the fact that that at least thought you would get out of our way." I never thought you'd write this stupid letter, right? You know, like you can see his anger, but he then pleads with them saying, don't you realize, and, and he, these are his words, not mine, and I know this is a complicated thing, and this became very controversial within the civil rights and beyond civil rights community, but he overtly says, look, the black nationalists today have a different agenda than I have for civil rights, and obviously the Jim Crow racists have a different agenda than I do. And civil rights. What I'm advocating for is for nonviolence from beginning to end, and I'm here doing it to you again in letter, even though they denied me a legal pad. My attorney had to fight for me just to get a legal pad to crank out this little <laughs> letter. Um, and, and I think that in that position he takes, um, he also, by the way, uh, notes and he calls out Elijah Muhammad by name in that letter. He notes that I am a committed Christian man, I am committed to to what I believe is the true gospel message in my faith. I am not willing to part uh, easily or at all with that tradition, his tradition at the time. And I think that all of these things show that, you know, we can sometimes be very dismissive of the so-called moderate. And of course he talks about the white moderate, the white liberal moderate, and says they're the real problem. And what he means is you, the clergy. But I think there's another sense of moderation here that the letter really exposes. So if Juana could have written a poem like Hombres Nestus, stupid men, <laughs> to, uh, to the bishop. And I think it wouldn't have communicated. I don't think it would have worked. I don't think we'd be talking about it the same we are now. I'm glad she wrote the poetry. <laughs> and King, on the other hand, he has different intervals of, of address. And I think there's speeches where there is a form of shouting, you're the black preacher after all, after all within the Baptist tradition, you know, so I know he knew how to elevate his voice. But it was within the realm of speech and not within the realm of, 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 of noise making. And so I think there's a lot of room for the passions here, but I do think there is an external of that, which I would call violence, that is out of bounds within the realm of how I would conceive of this, you know. And, um, that's a difficult question. You know, in Canada, there's uh, an indigenous scholar, Glenn Coulthard, who has a book called uh, 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 White Masks, Red Skins. And he has an entire chapter called Seeing Red, where he tries to uh, uh, critique Franz Fanon's unwillingness 
to advocate for violence and moral emotions like rage and stuff. And um, living in Canada, I have more effective capacity to hear Coltart's argument. Yet nonetheless, I, I, I continue to stand with King and, and the abolitionist tradition of, of his time to say direct action, yes, absolutely, mutual aid, absolutely, but nonviolence too, right? And I think that there's something at the core of the letter that's a form of nonviolence that is going to gain one, not only the obvious enemies, <laughs> we, know who, we know who and where they are, and, and, and there's plenty of them, and that's 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 a battle I, I, I invite and want to not overestimate. That's why they might put some moderation here, but I'm I'm in it and I'm happy that I feel honored to be in it. But also there's going to be other points of disalliance, I think, with those who fall into a kind of despair or kind of cynicism that they would argue would merit a, a move into forms of direct action that violate that rule of nonviolence. And um, I, I think that, you know, Hannah Arendt says that violence is sort of like the edge where politics stops happening. Um, and, and politics is a place where, you know, you can't be, you can't do that. And I tend to take her points on, on that pretty closely. So, uh, yeah, I think that's very much within the realm. And of course, so Juana's pacifism in the form of how she ended her life um, would bear that out as well, you know, pretty strongly. But I know that these days it's a controversial point to take. Afro pessimism, some of the, the ways in which struggles for racial justice have been characterized recently create some real junctures. And even before the influence of certain, not only you know, Black nationalism, but also I would say sort of uh, pan Marxism across Latin America through the revolution of Latin America, the question of violence is always on the mind of Pablo Freire, always on the minds of Augusto Salazar Ponti, all the minds of you know, Latin American scholars. And so, we need to have the argument though about violence too. <laughs> and that's maybe one, maybe I part with the tradition a bit and where I'm very interested in Coulthard sitting at the table uh, non-violently and defending his argument for violence, right? And so I'm willing to have the conversation, but that's about as far as I would go. Yes. Uh, thank you so much um, for this talk. And then the class I'm not too familiar with so Juan's letters, but uh, definitely be reading them Great. in this process. Um, I just wanted to know how do you see the letter in that mode as something that is written as advocacy as a woman on behalf of the other women that she was around, um, versus make, making an argument that that speaks truth to power as a theological investigation. Um, possible redemption. Huh. You say a bit more about the so you do you mean the sort of performative sense in which she's speaking as a woman on behalf of women on the one hand, and then the sort of technical character of her theological acumen and whatnot? Yes, so could those be separated yeah. when it's, that letter is received? Oh, I love this, but I love this question because I. Oh, I love this question because, well, because you know, whatever. I'm a Mexican American scholar talking to a lot of Mexican American <laughs> author from a long time ago or whatever. But like, I would, I would hope, and this is my way of answering your question. I would hope that what I've said today uh, isn't um, only understood on the basis of my identity, but I'm also not willing to hide for that sake, the, the sense in which that maybe perhaps not only my understanding of the language and my training in philosophy or whatever, my, my identity as a Roman Catholic, any of those things, that I do think that there is something that I can say perhaps as a Mexican American uh, here today uh, that matters. But the, but, but the, the line between those things uh, that you've painted is, is, is a very delicate one, I think. And, you know, I'm thinking again of King, you know, he marched, one of those nine signatories was, was the auxiliary bishop of Mobile, Alabama, Roman Catholic. Uh, and he marshals Aquinas and Augustine <laughs> and, and, and Catholic intellectual letters against the Roman Catholic auxiliary bishop uh, in his letter to Birmingham jail. I don't think King was naive about what he was doing there. Um, 
And I think though there are cases in which this is also an in-group out-group situation, right? So I think whenever Keynes speaks to, it's like Carnegie Woodson's Miseducation of the Negro is largely written to the Negro colleges of his time and to the black church of his time. He wasn't primarily, he didn't understand himself to be speaking to the white majority community. When we read Woodson today, it can seem like he's just coordinating his community, but my point is to say, no, he's talking to his community and he's not talking to us. And so we need to learn how to read that text as not the one being addressed, whereas obviously letter to Birmingham jail is kind of working different. Here, the mode of address is to the outgroup, right? And when we find ourselves in mixed, multicultural, interreligious, international, whatever groups, I think we're always modulating and we're always looking how people are presenting in a room and how that moves and flows and works. And I think it's a beautiful dance, but your, your point to see those two sides, I think is really astute. And I think we need to appreciate Sofwana as a mestiza, as a, a woman, as a, a, a nun, you know, all these things in, as intersectional and rich way. But we also though need to be able to say um, her capacity with languages, right? <laughs> Look at that, uh, her, her subtlety with, uh, with, with logical syllogistic argumentation. Can we find the premises and see if they follow? And when we see that they do, it just takes off some pages and there's lots of things in between. We graph it and stuff. We need to be able to use all that power as well, right? And so the, the cool thing about speaking truth power is it takes a lot of power to do it, right? It takes an enormous capacity of, of, and kind of power to be able to speak truth to power. And then that's part of why I say, if you find yourself speaking truth to power, you're probably not the powerless. And so, you know, that old age old question of his subaltern speak, you know, it comes up again, but you know, whenever John comes back from the North from his studies and he arrives at his community, he's un, un unintelligible to his community. Yet his sister wants to know more. And I mean, that's to me the, that's where those two, that line you drew between those two parts is really important. And all I can say is, is attack that line as much as you can, because it's really, 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 really fertile ground. Yeah. I, um, for me, to put an ending to this conversation, <laughs> the time has come. I also want to um, thank you. Well, thank the students for staying beyond. Yes. I'm history. so sorry. Yeah, I am. No, no. You're good because it's safe. Now you're free to do our last time.